Uh, good morning, everyone who's uh, joining us today, or good afternoon or evening. Uh, I'm Stephen Grubbs. I'm our Vice President of uh, Clinical Affairs at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And I welcome you to our monthly ASCO Global Webinar Series entitled Cancer Care Experiences and Lessons During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Today's topic will be breast cancer during the time of COVID-19. Next slide, please. The presentations and answers to questions about COVID-19 presented in these webinars are provided by the American Society of Clinical Oncology for voluntary informational use by providers. This information is not intended to substitute for independent professional judgment of the treating provider in the context of treating an individual patient or developing practice policies and procedures. Next slide, please. So the ASCO Global Webinar Series has been active since the onset of the pandemic in the spring of this year. Initially, we had weekly uh, webinars. Now they're monthly webinars, and they last anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes. We've uh, retained all the prior webinars, and you can actually review those on our recordings posted on ASCO's YouTube channel, and you can see the, uh, the website address for this uh, channel. Next slide, please. So it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce our moderator, Dr. Carolyn Hendricks. Carolyn is a avid volunteer at ASCO and has served on many committees and actually has led many committees during her time at ASCO. Uh, she is a renowned breast oncologist in Maryland in the, in the Washington, D.C. area. So, Carolyn, uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for doing the moderator's job today. Carolyn, you are muted. <laughs> You're welcome again. And I want to take a few minutes first to uh, introduce our, our panel. I'm joined on the panel this morning by Dr. Roselle de Guzman. She's a medical oncologist and head of the oncology unit and associate professor at Manila Central University, the FDTMF hospital in Manila, Philippines. Also by Dr. Michael Gannett, he's a surgical oncologist and professor of surgery at the Medical University of Vienna in Austria. Also by Dr. Verna Van de Poy. she's a radiation oncologist, senior consultant at the National Center for Radiotherapy, Oncology and Nuclear Medicine at the Corbleu Bleu Teaching Hospital in Ghana. Also by Dr. Jorge Novo, he's a pathologist Assistant Professor of Pathology at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. And finally, by Dr. Jessica Leung. She's a radio radiologist and professor of diagnostic radiology, a deputy chair and section chief, a section, uh, section chief of breast imaging at the University of Texas at MD Anderson. Welcome to all of you. Next slide, please. Next slide. Just a reminder about how we're going to be handling questions and answers during this webinar. In order to ask a question, please post it in the WebEx Q&A box. It's unlikely that we're going to be able to address all of the questions in the webinar. We will incorporate questions and feedback received into our respective coronavirus resource pages. Next slide, please. The, the format of this uh, webinar is going to be by case presentation. We're going to be starting out with a case of an elderly woman with early stage breast cancer and an incidental endometrial cancer who experienced significant postoperative complications. And the panel is going to be solicited on their inputs about COVID-19 testing in this context, how clinical decision making has been impacted by the pandemic, how we pr have been prioritizing patients uh, globally uh, elderly patients, patients with comorbid conditions, complex uh, uh, complexities in their medical care, how we're tackling the issues, the important issues of patient and staff safety during the pandemic, 
the impact of treatment delays, particularly in the elderly population, management of drug shortages when it's appropriate, and how we've modified uh, utilization of our resources to help care uh, for these patients, and then wrap up with lessons learned. After our first case presentation, uh, we'll move to the second case, which is a younger patient who presents with locally advanced and widely metastatic breast cancer, including an impending spinal cord compression. But initially, we're going to start out with case number one, presented by Dr. de Guzman. Next slide, please. Next slide. Dr. Hendricks, so our first case is a 78-year-old female who in May 2020 noted skin dimpling and self-palpated a left breast mass approximately 2.5 centimeters and a left axillary lymph node approximately 1 centimeter. A diagnostic mammography was done, which uh, confirmed the findings. Next slide, please. On further workups, there was no distant metastasis, so the clinical staging then was T2 and 1 M0, but on pelvic ultrasound, there was a finding of thickened endometrial stripe, which was 1.4 centimeters. The patient is a known hypertensive and diabetic, both well controlled, and had a history of bilateral knee osteoarthritis requiring cortisone injections. She had a PS1 and geriatric age screening score was 17 points. Next slide, please. So it was uh, decided upon by the MDT for the patient to have uh, excision biopsy after a negative COVID testing by RT-PCR. So she was scheduled for surgery on July 2020. And, uh, she had excision biopsy and was a frozen section showing invasive ductal carcinoma measuring 2.8 centimeters. The gynecologist then proceeded with endometrial dilatation and curettage while awaiting for the frozen biopsy result. And when during the, the, the procedure of endometrial curettage, there was note of very friable tissues that easily bled. But later on, after a few minutes, the efficient biopsy showing invasive ductal carcinoma confirming a carcinoma, they proceeded with a left modified radical mastectomy and axillary dissection. The decision then to proceed with um, excision biopsy and left modified radical mastectomy at the same time endometrial curettage was it was during the time when there was implementation of a strict a stay-at-home policy. There was uh, uh, the healthcare system was uh, thinly stretched at that time with limitations in hospital beds and the uh, workforce. The patient was uneventful postoperatively. She was discharge improved. Next slide, please. The pathology result of the mastectomy specimen. Uh, confirmed invasive carcinoma with micropapillary features, grade 2, no lymphovascular invasion. Axillary dissection showed positive 2 out of 9 axillary lymph nodes, negative margins of resection. ER and PR were both positive, altered score of 8. HER2 negative, KI67, 40%. The pathologic staging was stage 2B. T2, N1, M0, and the endometrial curating specimen revealed a typical complex hyperplasia. At the time, the gynecologist uh, was strongly suspicious of uh, and It took a while when the result of the mastectomy was out, so the patient patient was being planned for another surgery. Next slide. Please. 
So after obtaining another COVID negative, which underwent total abdominal hysterectomy and total single oophorectomy in August 2020. However, day two postoperatively, she developed acute dyspnea, had hypoxemia that required ICU transfer. On chest X-ray, there was no pneumonia, no pulmonary congestion, but CT angiogram revealed a right pulmonary artery embolism, and duplex scan showed acute DVT and chronic DVT on tibial and peroneal veins, external iliac, common femoral and superficial femoral veins, respectively. IBC filter placement was done. Next slide, please. The pathology of the uh, Tabiso specimen came out showing endometrial adenocarcinoma, endometrial type 2, fecal grade 1 in a background of atypical endometrial hyperplasia with less than 50% myometrial invasion and negative pelvic lymph nodes. Pathologic stage was stage 1A, T1A, M0, M0. Dr. Hendrick. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation of our case. We're going to move now, next slide please, to some questions for discussion about this case. And I think the power of this panel is the global input, so as I query the, the panelists, feel free to discuss how this case would be managed in your own part of the world. But we're going to start out with the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on this older woman with early stage breast cancer, but some complexities to her case, and ask Dr. Leung to talk a little bit about how diagnostic breast imaging has been impacted by COVID-19 in her part of the world. Dr. Leung. Dr. Leung, can you hear me? Thank you, Dr. Hendricks, is, uh, okay. for the opportunity for this webinar. Uh, in terms of the impact of COVID in breast imaging in Houston and in the United States where I uh, work and live is that impact is primarily on screening and what's considered non-essential breast imaging. Um, if a patient has a palpable lump, any skin changes, et cetera, we would, that was largely not impacted uh, in the United States because they can be serious signs of breast cancer, as in this woman, uh, even during the acute phases. Indeed, during the acute phases of COVID, and when acute phase, it really depends on your particular locale, because as we know, uh, it doesn't affect the entire country as a whole in the same manner. So that the screening, which is considered elective, was on hold but most diagnostic indications would be workup as usual, if you will. Now, there are some diagnostic indications that are less likely to be cancer, for example, breast pain, and uh, they may not be seen for diagnostic imaging as readily as non-COVID era, but for diagnostic palpable lumps and any skin changes, yes. And the typical course for that would be mammography followed by ultrasound followed by biopsy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And next we want to move in terms of the context of this case and globally. I want to ask Dr. Jorge Novo about the impact of breast pathology on cases like this, older patients, maybe difficult to get them to screening, the implications of pathology in terms of breast biopsy, establishing the diagnosis, and the primary surgery in this case, both her breast cancer and endometrial pathology. What impact has the COVID-19 uh, pandemic had on your practice in your part of the world? All right, so for our pathology continue to be uh, usually the driving force for our decision-making process. So in, because we have two contexts here in the gynecological aspect and the breast aspect. So in our, in our hospital for the aspect of breast uh, cancer management, uh, biopsies continue to be the main driving force before any surgery is done, including review of outside pathology. So if this was our, a situation that happened in our hospital, for instance, that we got the patient with a breast cancer, our breast radiology colleagues will have a limited um, appointments, uh, except for those that are considered more urgent uh, in manner. 
we will be able to obtain the pathology. And at that point, the clinicians as well as the oncologists will be able to decide whether these patients can be, uh, should be continuous plans, especially those that are considered high risk or new adjuvant setting. Uh, we will potentially consider the options of new adjuvant chemotherapy or hormone therapy. For instance, in this case, we have a situation where both uh, hormone therapy will be a potential option given her hormone profile in the breast cancer, as well as the presence of a typical hyperplasia, in order to provide a more safe window for operations. And uh, continuing in the endometrial setting, uh, also will be managed completely by the biopsy service. Thank you for that input. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Ganan to discuss how surgical decision-making in a case like this, an older patient presenting with both breast cancer and endometrial cancer, some comorbidities leading into surgery, and then obviously some very substantial post-operative risks. How has the COVID pandemic impacted your uh, surgical practice and group in Austria regarding these complex uh, patients and their surgical management? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Hendricks. I, I think, you know, um, many of us have been affected by the pandemic, and uh, particularly in such a case, uh, while everybody tried not to postpone necessary procedures, I think, as Dr. Novo has said, in, in, in my center, we would probably, based on the biopsy, um, have tried to postpone to get to a, a window that is that is more safe. Uh, when, you know, the pandemic was at its height in, in, in my region, uh, which was in early spring, we essentially shut down um, all elective surgeries for a number of weeks, uh, which I believe uh, we learned that is not a very good way, um, because what we see is that uh, the potential harm and damage for patients uh, by postponing necessary surgical oncology procedures, but also other oncologic treatments may be much greater than actual uh, COVID infections, which uh, obviously we want to avoid anyway. So very complex situation, and particularly with the, with the uh, concomitant uh, endometrial cancer. And as could be seen in this case, uh, subsequent uh, complication management, I think, uh, in, in such a situation, pandemic or not, unless you're completely uh, run out of resources, um, you have to provide the state of the art to the patient irrespective of, of uh, COVID. Thank you very much for that input. Now I'd like to turn to you, Dr. Vanderpoy, and talk about the issues related to breast radiotherapy. This is an older patient, a lot of complex medical conditions and, and surgical complications. How would you manage, in your part of the world in Ghana, how would you manage her breast radiotherapy decision-making in this era of the pandemic? Muted. You're muted. Actually, Ghana doesn't have that much of a, a burden of COVID cancer cases. We have a remarkable number of um, recoveries with less than 1,000 active cases. However, we know data is always a problem in, in this part of the world. Um, but from what we see, but then at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all scared, she could have had her treatment delayed. And since she was ERPR positive, hormone receptor positive, and also the fact that she had um, her uterus removed, we wouldn't be worried about um, further endometrial carcinoma with tamoxifen or whatever is available. Um, so we would have liked to start with hormonal therapy and, while she, and waiting for the six week window period, even up to three months, and hopefully um, we'll be able to get over the pandemic then to have a radiotherapy. All the same, a lot of studies came out or I'll say propositions came out during the COVID era about adjusting our radiotherapy um, causes to um, increase the use of hypofractionated radiotherapy. And indeed, we have the FAST and the FAST forward trial that uses about um, a single fraction five, just five times, either weekly or daily. And that is fascinating um, to reduce the number of exposures that this lady has to um, the other sick people in the department and also for the staff as well. So it will be a very welcome thing uh, for her to have hypo, 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 hypo fractionated radiotherapy. We, we would have typically done about um, three weeks of treatment, but in, him, in her case, it could easily be um, done at five fractions instead of 15, 
But then I'll say many years ago when I was a resident, there was even a hypofractionation regimen of once a week for elderly women with ERPR positive, low risk breast cancer. And this is something that could be applicable in her situation. Um, at least she doesn't have to have radiotherapy to the pelvis because it's not indicated because she has early stage um, um, disease. So I think for us, I think um, um, in this era right now where we are, where we are recovering from the COVID, she'll probably get um, um, 15 fractions of radi daily radiotherapy. But I also like to discuss it with, with the family because she does have the heavy burden of, of um, DVTs and she does really have an issue. So we might also think about hypofractionating her to have just about six fractions because overall she's, she has a high risk um, of other problems have coming up. Thank you. Thank you. And now as we, we're going to turn back to you, Dr. De Guzman, and talk about your recommendations for management of this patient as a breast medical oncologist and any lessons that you've learned in the management of this patient in the era of COVID-19. Um, first of all, um, managing early stage breast cancer for a medical oncologist is more of a balancing act. We want to make sure we're providing quality care for our patients. At the same time, we have to balance that with the potential risk of exposure and developing severe COVID-19 infection. So for, for this particular case, we have to, what we learned is, uh, we have to remember since the patient is an elderly woman, that these elderly patients who are, the group of patients who are particularly vulnerable for COVID-19 infection. And we have to remember that the, the, the pros and cons. We have uh, seen patients when the outbreak uh, happened uh, for those who are low risk, uh, I agree with what was mentioned earlier by the other panelists that we do give them endocrine immunotherapy just to bridge them to surgery later on when the pandemic uh, or the, the situation is more controlled. We've seen um, more aggressive cancers or locally advanced cancers that have uh, stopped therapy but because of the situation, the, the restrictions and the limitation in terms of resources, workforce, and the limiting hospitalizations, we have to come up with a decision of balancing what will be the best for the patient as well as uh, make, making it an informed decision and considering primarily as well patient's preferences. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other panelists who want to speak up on lessons that have learned by, by these cases of elderly patients, early stage breast cancer? This is a real world case. It wasn't, uh, uh, and it presents the complications. Any other lessons learned in early breast cancer in the era of COVID-19? And if not, we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, I just want to make the general. Uh, I was going to make a general statement that uh, screening mammography, even in the elderly, has been shown to save lives. And uh, I discussed during the COVID era that screening mammography was considered relatively non-essential and therefore put on pause in light of everything that was going on. But uh, in many places uh, in the United States currently, screening mammography is offered as uh, before pre-COVID. And I would encourage all of us to consider that for all our patients because this is a test that's shown through randomized control trials to save lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Leon. Look, if, okay. if I can second this, um, what, what we have seen that it's now September and it's still in many European countries, we are down about 20% with breast cancer prevalence, which is highly unlikely that that's real. So it's much more likely that that's uh, missed uh, early detection. And these uh, patients will experience their diagnosis in, in the forthcoming months. So I can only uh, underline what we always say. Unless you are really in a dramatic situation, you should try to keep uh, all the early detection programs uh, going. And that's probably not only true for breast cancer, but for other um, uh, 
early detection programs as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Nan. I'll take this opportunity now. I'm going to transition to the second case. Next slide, please. This slide is going to be presented by Dr. Van de Quay. Welcome. This is a case again of a, a patient with a locally advanced and metastatic cancer. All right. Thank you, everybody. Next slide, please. So the second case is a 42-year-old female, premenopausal with a two-year history of a right breast lump. Notice while she was breastfeeding her two-month-old baby then. It was associated with a decrease in breast size, pure derange, but no nipple changes or nipple discharge. She self-managed with herbal medications, both oral and topical. However, a month prior to presentation, she experienced severe difficulty, severe pain with difficulty in mobilization, requiring the use of a wheelchair. Her pain score was on a visual score was nine over ten. Um, she had no history of urine or stool incontinence, no headaches, seizures, memory loss, visual impairment, vomiting, cough, or chest pain. There was no significant family history of uh, of cancer, nor of other medical um, issues. She had medically at age 15. She had four kids and full-term pregnancy at the age of her first full-term pregnancy was the age of 29. She had no history of oral contraceptive use, no history of alcohol or tobacco use. She's a secretary in a private legal firm and is married. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. So on examination, she was found to have ECOG-1. She was not pale, anecteric, afebrile, hair hydration. She had no cervical or supraclavicular adenopathy bilaterally. Her cardiorespiratory and abdominal examination was essentially normal. On her examination of the breast, however, the hard breast exhibited a 6 cm um, hard uh, mass occupying the upper, outer, and inner quadrants. It was not attached to the underlying structures. The skin was, however, adherent to the tumor with pure range. There were no other nipple changes or discharge. On the left breast, there was a hard tumor in the upper, inner quadrants, um, about 2 cm, not attached to the underlying muscles. Next slide. On examination of the axilla, on the right side, she had a 3 cm mobile axillary node. On the left side, there were no palpable axillary lymph nodes. On neurological examination, she had a power 5 over 5 on all her limbs, including the external, um, the lower limbs. Light and pain sensation were intact. However, on the pine, we elicited tenderness along um, thoracic vertebral tend to the um, first sacral vertebrae. Next slide. So on further investigation, we had a biopsy of the breast lump, which showed um, the true cut biopsy was of both breasts, and it showed a grade three invasive carcinoma, no otherwise specified. Immunohistochemistry was ERPR intermediate five and six, and her two, three plus and KI67 was greater than 20. Um, due to the uh, symptoms, she underwent an MRI of the spine, which showed T6 to T5 spine metastasis. T10 to T12 was associated with um, cord indentation and spinal canal stenosis. At L1 and 2, there was an extra osseous epidural soft tissue mass, causing displacement of the cardia equina. Again, she had multiple lytic and, and um, lesions in the pelvic bones, proximal femur, sacrum. Um, however, she had no liver or bone, met um, sorry, no liver metastasis. Um, sorry, that was a typo. Um, her blood work was essentially normal. Her corrected calcium was 2.02, which was essentially normal. Next slide. So a diagnosis of metastatic um, bilateral cancer with multiple bone lesions, luminal B, her two positive chemo naive was made. Next slide. So this was a CT scan for her treatments, which exhibited the, the, the lesions, as you can see, all the way from T, including the sternum, all the way down to the sacrum. You can see the expanding nature of the tumor and the S1, and um, even in the spinous processes of the lower vertebrae was also involved. And the other um, scan, you can see the bony lesions involving the sacrum, west of all the sacroiliac joints. And um, next slide, please. 
Again, you can appreciate the images and just to show the extent of the images confirming what the diagnosis is. Next slide. So, um, this is a patient who came in as an emergency. Um, with a, she was started on dexamethasone, 8 milligrams BID for five days. You ask why? It's because um, the treatments sometimes take a little bit of a while because it takes time for them to, we have a lot of out-of-payment, out-of-pocket payments for our treatments. It takes quite a bit of time to mobilize to find money for the CT scan for, for, for treatment. Um, it's so extensive that we thought two-dimensional radiotherapy might be a little bit problematic. I want to see exactly how to match the field. So we decided to do a CT planning to treat her on the LENAC. So the plans were to give her external, but you could see it was so extensive and we were actually devastated. Um, we decided we were throwing around a lot of options because like we said in the COVID era, we don't want her to visit the hospital as quickly as, you know, um, frequently as she could. And there's a lot of data support, single fraction, multi-fraction, there's nothing wrong with either of them. The outcomes might be a little bit different, but in her case, she has so much extensive, but bony lesions, and we know that with breast cancer and bony lesions, our patients might be able to live much longer than um, um, organ involvement. So either to give eight gray or six gray in a single fraction to the hemi body, um, to the upper hemi body, a lower hemi body, that's two different fractions, or we split up the, the lesions into three phases um, to the upper thoracic, the middle thoracic, the lower thoracic, the lower and the L spine, and then the pelvis, including the femoral head. All, these, all of these areas will get um, 12 fractions, that's two and a half weeks of treatment or two weeks of treatment. Even though as much as you wanted to treat uh, in the shortest possible time, it is an extremely extensive disease and given the whole spine, radiation might actually be technically difficult and she might have a lot of immunosuppression, including low blood counts, which might affect the future of getting any um, systemic therapy. So we have available the cobalt 60, which we use for two-dimensional and three-dimensional radiotherapy. But the extent of her disease was so much that we decided to treat her on the Clinac 6MV, and not with IMRT, just with regular 2D radiation. So we'll be able to see what we are, where we are matching our fields. Um, of course, we treated her with antimetrics and antidiuretics because it is a very expensive, extensive field. And she's going to get immediately that day, she received her zoledronic acid even though in as much as the calcium level was normal, it reduces the incidence of further skeletal related events. And then she's managed on uh, narcotics and NSAIDs. The issue with the systemic therapy now is, um, is she going to get a single agent? Is she going to get oral treatment? She's going to get Herceptin um, uh, with uh, her radiotherapy, which is, was phased in uh, like three phases. Um, is she going to get, get hormonal um, treatment because of the COVID or will extend it to single agent chemotherapy with Herceptin? Um, is she going to get ovarian suppression because this lady is premenopausal? So if we decide to go with hormonal therapy first, so it's a little bit of a mixed bag and depending on the situation, unfortunately for us, cost is also a major issue. We have available in our country uh, most of the basic therapies like Tassumab, Metaxanes, Antracyclines, Capsizabine all on health insurance. We have gemcipitin, binca alkaloids, HER2 therapies. Other HER2 therapies outside of Tassusma have to be paid for. And hormonal therapies, including the um, aromatase inhibitors, are on insurance, but fast food dex and CDK inhibitors are paid out of pocket. So unfortunately, the choice of treatment here will vary based on the socioeconomic state of the patient. But even the physicians in this country cannot afford all these treatments, so it really is a problem. But I'd like to see how um, the treatment would be different depending on which part of the world you are in terms of your health system and what you do different in the COVID era. Next slide. So single fraction in basis to such extensive disease in four fractions, in 10 fractions, or in a single fraction. Would it be wise to withhold steroids here because she's going to have the steroids for a longer time and because there are some indication that steroids might worsen uh, um, immunosuppression and increase the risk of COVID and any of our patients could have COVID in the environment. Um, could we do hemibody? Uh, which areas have to be prioritized because she's walking uh, but at the same time we know that she could get into uh, uh, paralysis uh, as quickly as possible. 
and could we do ARAC Excitabin and Herceptin 3 weekly? Because 3 weekly just comes. Could we do Herceptin since it's now and sub Q at home while she takes the ARAC Excitabin? Do we just let her come in 3 weekly with Herceptin or weekly? Or do we just start with hormonal therapy and Herceptin just to keep her at home as much as possible? Dual targeting is not an option for us. And then CDK inhibitors are also not an option for us. Or could we just add CDK inhibitors um, based on the phase two Patricia trial to see if we can um, do something different from her? I'm not really sure because most of these treatments will tend to be oral. So thank you very much. I'm waiting to hear from you. Next slide, please. Thank you for outlining our options. This is a complicated case. We first want to engage Dr. Leon. Let's hear in this complicated case. What is your input regarding the impact of COVID-19 on imaging in this uh, situation? Are there cases where you have had to streamline or modify the recommendations for epigraphic staging in patients with newly diagnosed with widely metastatic disease? Uh, what an interesting case and uh, very sad about the widespread disease that that was presented. Uh, I would say that during COVID, our newly diagnosed metastatic disease patient has not really been impacted uh, in most parts, if not all parts of the United States. Uh, what has been impacted, like we said, has been primarily the relatively non-elective um, imaging, which is prim primarily screening in that setting, but any diagnostic symptomatic indications and definitely widely metastatic disease pretty much went through with the usual systemic staging as per the norm. And what would that be? Uh, likely depends on a particular facility. Most of us like to follow the NCCN guidelines, the National Com uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center guideline, Network guidelines. But of, of course, uh, I would encourage that whatever imaging is done is whatever is, would be useful for our clinical colleagues, our surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, what they need to do. At our particular institution, uh, we follow the NCCN guidelines, and mostly uh, PET-CT is one that's widely utilized for newly diagnosed metastatic disease. Of course, appreciating that PET-CT is a very advanced and uh, likely expensive a modality that is not uh, widely available in most parts of the world, of course, I have to add that caveat. So again, is what the clinical colleagues need and use for wherever they may be working. Uh, I'd like to uh, conclude by saying that in terms of imaging of the breast itself, there's always the question, is there indication when the patient already has systemic state, a systemic disease like the patient that was shown? And uh, what I've observed in MD Anderson where I work is that many of our colleagues will use the breast as kind of a window into the rest of the body in term, when they try out medical therapy. Uh, whether it's responding to the breast, in the breast or not, may be a good uh, indication of how it may or may not be responding in the rest of the body. And of course, we have great imaging tests to look at the breast themselves. So even though it may not affect the overall outcome, uh, we often will continue to image the breast in terms of following disease, uh, mammography and ultrasound for the most part, and sometimes MR. And largely that has not been impacted during COVID. Thank you. I'd next like to, like to query Dr. Jorge Novo about the impact of breast pathology and documentation of distant metastatic disease and whether at your institution you've had to forego biopsy confirmation of distant metastatic uh, disease in these cases where there's a very high level of urgency and potentially limited uh, uh, resources in this regard. Well, I think it also is very dependent, for instance, in this situation that is uh, unfortunately very advanced. Um, the imaging and the clinical as uh, you know great clinical and imaging um, findings are consistent with the breast primary that has been biopsy before uh, documentation of distances may or may not be necessary depending on the institution and the available resources i think what uh, drives most important here as long as we have a uh, as in this case availability of hormone and potential therapeutic markers um, i think that will be sufficient at least to get it started you know, if there's foci that may not be responding or there's an increase in uh, perhaps metastatic foci available, then an, an additional biopsy may be necessary given the possibility of subclonal populations that may not be responding to the current therapy regime. 
Thank you for that. And Dr. Kanat, next to you from the surgical standpoint, is there any way that this case would, would influence your clinical practice in the pre-COVID era and, and the current era regarding surgical intervention, surgical intervention, with the caveat that she has very locally advanced disease and that might be breast surgical intervention or possibly neurosurgical intervention as the case might be? Yeah, I, I believe, I mean, in this uh, particular case, uh, surgery is in a waiting position. Um, so either for palliation in case there is a stabilization procedure um, uh, needed, um, um, doing surgery on the primary or any metastasis uh, is uh, obviously not, uh, not an option according uh, to all guidelines and should be avoided irrespective of, of COVID. I think in such a case, um, we have excellent medical options, which uh, hopefully, particularly if HER2 uh, her positive, um, you know, could also lead to a rapid response and thus improving uh, the patient's general situation rather quickly. Um, clearly, depending on resources, I mean, in my center, this patient would probably receive dual blockade um, together with some um, you know, basis uh, chemotherapy, but that may not uh, may or may not be available. I don't think that CDK46 at this point in time uh, should be used in such a situation now. Resources aside, in in her two positive disease, but so no no role for surgery unless uh, uh, needed to ensure improve or stabilize quality of life. Thank you for that. And now we'll turn to you, of course, Dr. de Guzman, because the, the issues are complex. We want to hear from your uh, standpoint as a medical oncologist in Manila, how would this uh, patient be managed in your part of the world in the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic? Yeah, this is a young premenopausal patient, HER2 positive, so definitely she'll be receiving uh, anti-HER2 therapy, uh, which is Duzumab, and if the resources would allow uh, a dual blockade as what Dr. Ganad uh, has mentioned earlier, um, the choice of chemotherapy in combination would be either docetaxel or paclitaxel, but in the COVID situation, um, we have as much as possible consider the myelosuppression suppression that uh, goes with uh, docetaxel. So it would be uh, more ideal to offer a weekly paclitaxel, however, that you have to consider that that will require more frequent hospital visits. If uh, we had to give um, a chemo agent that's um, highly myelosuppressive, we will be more liberal or we'll lower our threshold in giving growth factors. Uh, in the non-COVID situation, we typically give uh, growth factor support for protocols with uh, more than 20% chance of uh, producing myelosuppression. But in the COVID situation, we sort of lower our threshold. Although there are some reports on the use of GCSF growth factors that may might um, uh, exacerbate or cause more severe COVID-19 infection. So we have to be careful in monitoring our patients when they're receiving uh, growth factors. Um, if uh, with the very limited uh, resources and patients would not be able to uh, receive anti-HER2 blockade, and that is uh, a common scenario for uh, low, low resource settings, then definitely, as uh, was presented by Verna a while ago, um, definitely hormonal treatment is an option. Uh, with GNRH uh, analog, uh, we've, we've, we've uh, have, uh, uh, shown that uh, hormonal treatments do not cause any problem in terms of uh, immune suppression. With regard to the use of steroids, uh, would be a little bit uh, uh, limitation in the use as uh, this might uh, cause or increase the risk for immune suppression and might uh, expose the patient at risk of contracting COVID-19. 
Thank you very much for the input. And now we'd like to return to you, Dr. Van der Poy, talk a little bit about the radiotherapy treatment planning again, which is your area of expertise, and also the lesson that you've learned in managing this very complicated patient grappling with devastating uh, disease, potentially life-threatening, and how you would offer other aspects of palliative care in this clinical situation. Okay, so for her, it, I, it's like a, I was tempted to throw my arms up because you don't even know where to start from. It's easy to do the pain medicine, it's easy to do the hormonal therapy and the Herceptin, but with the radiotherapy, it was really a bit of a problem where to start from. So we know the most important thing is the spinal cord. Uh, when it gets uh, compressed for more than 72 hours, you are going to be in trouble. So that was our priority. So anything from T, so her T6 lesion all the way to her L1 lesion was what was priority. So that was the first thing that was treated. Again, that was too long, so we had to treat it in, in four fractions. It's too long a field to treat at a single fraction. That was quite obvious. And because of the extent of the disease, the fields were a little bit wider than usual. Um, so that, that was, that was um, the priority. Then second, we treated the L spine, the lumbar spine, um, up to the S1. You could see that was also heavily involved. And again, it wasn't that a, of a simple field because of the extra osseous soft tissue lesion. That had to be included in the field. And um, so that also received, that received a single fraction because it, didn't, it wasn't that wide. And then the pelvis, including the femoral heads, received a single fraction of, um, of 10 gray. Um, so we kind of phased it out in three different, um, so five days for one treatment, and then a single fraction, and then a single fraction. She actually has tolerated it pretty well and is still walking. Um, the next option now is to start her on her, her setting, which she could have gotten with her radiation anyway, but sometimes it gets too complicated. Now, the issue, we, we, we tend to be a little bit, because she's luminal B, the temptation really is to go for chemotherapy, versus um, um, chemo, uh, sorry, to go for chemotherapy versus hormonal therapy. And also the fact that she's uh, too positive, I think it's quite uh, smart to do that. Um, but in terms of the radiation, we have completed five fractions. Single, we wish you could have treated with just a single fraction of 10 gray. If it was like a, a site that could be encompassed in a smaller field, that would have been the way to go. And we could have even treated two sites on the same day. Unfortunately, the disease was so so extensive. And with eight gray, it's likely we are probably going to retreat these areas again because the, the extent of the disease was quite wide. So we are looking out to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I just want to take a few minutes to query the entire panel about lessons that you've learned from your parts of the world, in the Philippines, Austria, Ghana, and the United States about dealing with newly diagnosed widely metastatic disease in our patients. What has been the impact of the, of the pandemic, and what have you learned over your in your areas of uh, special and specialties and expertise? I think. Can I start? I, I think that for me, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were saying uh, palliative cases can be they were not going to benefit that much from treatments, so you could actually delay their treatments. But I don't really agree with that because this is an area where you could really impact the quality of their life. So that was number one. The other thing I learned with the pandemic is that, so short courses are not that bad after all. Even though it's in the literature, there's enough evidence to support it, we tended to shy away from um, hypofractionation. But I think it's something to look at, you know, again, and, and come together with the family to decide which is best in this situation, again, trying to limit her exposure to, to, to treatment. But then again, radiating her whole spine, or her, her, her whole practically her HDR skeleton, is also associated with immunosuppression. So it's quite difficult here, and you cannot give um, GCSF with radiotherapy, so it has to be done afterwards. So a lot of things have come up with the COVID area um, in helping us to triage how we treat patients, and most importantly, to send them to the palliative care unit for supportive care because this is going to come up again. I think the main lesson here is that people are delaying their attendance to the hospitals because of the COVID. So what can we do to meet them halfway? Thank you. Thank you. I think for me as a diagnostic radiologist is that uh, breast cancer care and breast health is a multidisciplinary team effort with all of you, you know, our clinical colleagues. 
uh, especially in uh, the metastatic or the systemic disease patient. Uh, we have, for in terms of treatment, some of the low-grade DCIS, for example, surgery has been paused for those. And for the invasive cancer patients during the acute phases, like many of the panelists already said, endocrine or other types of medical therapy were given instead of surgery. And that is, of course, something I have not really seen in the United States in my uh, many years of career. So it's a matter of working with our colleagues in whatever setting you have, whatever is needed as a radiologist to provide uh, information. In the very dramatic case that was just presented, perhaps a spine MR would be indicated for our radiation oncologists to have enough of the information. Uh, so my lesson really is working with our colleagues in a multidisciplinary setting during COVID. Yeah, I'll have to agree with uh, overall the sentiment that uh, Dr. Long uh, was sharing is like, if there's anything that COVID has shown us during the COVID pandemic is that uh, cancer care is and has always had to be a multidisciplinary approach. Since no one given part, which if it's deficient, will be able to uh, manage these complex patients. And in addition, when it comes to managing during, let's say, we could reach another peak or another high prevalence of COVID in a particular community, uh, in order to be able to make those decisions in which we can, who gets to be treated, a continuous plan, who can be safely postponed, and uh, as well as available resources in your particular practice, which uh, for that reason, I don't think there's one particular guideline that we can have, but uh, that has to be a multidisciplinary discussion. Maybe if I can if, if I can add one one aspect, I think um, you know in my country, and I think in, in in many affluent countries, we have a rather hospital-centered system. And what we learned during the the acute phase of the pandemic is that you know we really need to speed up those processes of uh, making use of telemedicine of uh, interaction. I mean, I'm a surgeon, so we, you cannot do surgery remotely um, um, outside the, the robotic world, but not for breast cancer. But you can consult patients. You can avoid unnecessary uh, visits to the hospital. Um, and even you can interact in, in a much better way. To, to be honest, in some of our centers, we observed that uh, with technologies uh, like uh, WebEx or Zoom or, or some others, the attendance in the interdisciplinary tumor boards was actually better than when this was done in the analog uh, way. So I think uh, making better use of the options um, could give us, uh, is something that, is, uh, that we learned and that is to stay. And the other thing is that I think unless there is an extreme shortage of resources like PPE or something from a surgical point of view in terms of cancer surgery, um, we should not, following the guidelines of many international and national societies, we should not uh, postpone cancer surgeries unless in extremely low risk cases like like it was mentioned, low grade DCIS or maybe some, some types of thyroid cancer. All other cancer surgeries are basically uh, not to be postponed uh, for more than a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you. I just want to take a minute as we're wrapping up uh, uh, to remind the, uh, the, the attendees, next slide please, that in order to ask a question for the panelists, please go ahead and post it in the WebEx. We've run out of time, but we and so we are not able to address specific questions during this webinar. But we certainly will review the questions and provide feedback in the coronavirus resource pages on the ASCO uh, websites. Uh, next slide. And before I turn it over to Doug Pyle to wrap up this uh, webinar, I just want to extend a personal thanks to the members of this panel for your uh, energy and effort and participation, your expertise in helping our uh, participants learn about how you're managing uh, breast cancer uh, during the pandemic. Thank you, Dr. de Guzman, Dr. Gnant, Dr. Van de Puy, Dr. Novo, and Dr. Leon. And now I'll turn it over to you, Doug, for the wrap up. Well, thank you, Dr. Hendricks, and, and you took the words out of my mouth. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we at ASCA, of course, we talk about a global community, and we are a global community of different specialties, different geographies, 
And I think um, today's session really exemplified that, how we heard from so many different perspectives on very complex uh, cases and the shared lessons learned that we've all um, gleaned from this, um, this unfortunate experience. So thank you, Dr. Hendricks, for moderating the session so well. Thank you for all of the panelists for taking the time to share your expertise and your perspectives. And thank you all who have joined us uh, today from around the world to um, participate in this webinar. Um, again, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone that you, we do encourage you to submit topics uh, to the WebEx survey, which you'll receive at the conclusion of this webinar, uh, that we can consider topics for future webinars. Uh, as Steve mentioned at the beginning, the recordings will be posted on ASCO's YouTube channel, so please feel free to review those and share those with your colleagues. And uh, some of you may be interested in a certificate of attendance. If so, please send an email to international at asco.org. Once again, thank you all to all of the, the panelists, uh, Dr. Hendricks and all of you who joined us today. And please continue to stay safe, um, take care and um, all the best. And thanks from ASCO. Thank you. <laughs>